Hi, I'm Ripley. Some of you may know me from the podcast Chosen Ones. Can't fucking watch Chosen Ones. But what you may not know is I'm Forever Dan. And today, I'm going to talk about my world, Remnants. I super appreciate the support on the last video. It seems like most people were interested in hearing about the gods of this world. So today's discussion is going to center around that. On screen right now, I'm drawing one of said gods, quote unquote, uh, Alant the Golden, in his shadow, the last unicorn. With that context, I'm just going to jump into it because there is uh, a lot of lore to go over. <laughs> With remnants, belief is crucial to existence. For something to exist, one must believe it to be true. This is a fundamental principle in which the universe functions, and is a basic understanding as to how one may manifest their starlight, which is the magic of this setting. This is nowhere more clear than with the gods. Their power comes from people's belief in them, and from that shared belief do they grow further and further in influence, capable of sharing such power with their most devoted followers, which is why when the fracture hit, the gods were no more. As the fracture completely destroyed the universe, along with nearly everything within it, the gods were similarly wounded. The destruction of an entire universe is no small incident, and the gods that did survive this initial cataclysm were left to float alone, horribly wounded and without power, as all who once followed them ceased to be. The gods would weaken with time, left to wither away into nothingness as the universe slowly pieced itself back together over countless aeons. Until the Greater Wills reemerged. The Greater Wills They stole the title from Elden Ring, shut up. are cosmic entities of unfathomable form, akin to Lovecraftian horrors, who embody fundamental principles of reality itself. Life and death, nature and technology, knowledge and madness, blood and the cosmos, and much, much more. These divine beings were once crucial to the creation of reality, and once such reality was destroyed, they decided they would play a more present role in the next universe. The hierarchy of divinity goes, greater wills at the top, then the gods beneath them. Then beneath the gods are what the world of remnants knows as godbound. And beneath the godbound are shadows, but I'll get into those later. And then beneath those are vassals, but I like, definitely don't have time to get into those, so we'll talk about them later maybe. The godbound would be akin to demigods in our understanding. They are beings bound to potentially and or inevitably become a god, provided they meet certain requirements they need. And it is the godbound that would become the most prevalent throughout Remnants, and more specifically Gaia. Now, I'm going to tell you about some of the different godbound that exist within the world, but it should be noted that I'm, uh, I'm constantly creating new godbound and more lore for this world. Just last week, I had 88 pages in my document, and now I'm up to 96, so like, <laughs> I, I just I just keep writing. So, uh, while this is currently uh, some of the gods that I have, I'm making more and more uh, all the time. You could even leave a suggestion for some below. <laughs> when Gaia was in its early years, the Greater Wills made themselves known to the Fae they had chosen to become the vessels for their power. The way Godbound are chosen by the Greater Wills is widely unknown, but it generally seems that they pick people who, in some capacity, represent their ideals in some meaningful way. After the first god was created, Godbound quickly began to pop up more and more within the world. The first and only true god, of course, being the god of life, Borealis. Said to have been a devout follower of the Greater Will of Life, Borealis was granted the title of Godbound as a sign of their devotion. Wherever Borealis walked, plants would grow, people would be healed, and life flourished around them. It is even said that Borealis is to thank for the cycle of reincarnation we know today in Gaia. Borealis would be the first Faekin to complete the ritual of ascension into an archfey, and in the process would grow the god tree Yggdrasil, in which they were housed for weeks before emerging a true god. It was during Borealis' gestation within Yggdrasil that the greater will of death would be sealed within Hazel the Briard, and locked away beneath the very foundation of Gaia to sit for eternity, and, the greater wills hoped, would rot away into nothingness, thereby removing death completely from the very existence of the universe. From there, Yggdrasil would spread its roots throughout Gaia and absorb any souls who passed on, housing them until they could be reborn. Ever since their ascension to pure godhood, very little has been seen of Borealis. 
with some believing they have disappeared to spread life throughout the other planes. Others believing that they are creating a new plane of existence themselves, or some, more cynical, individuals believe Borealis has abandoned the world and has left them to fend for themselves. Of course, during that discussion, you heard me briefly mention Hazel the Briard, so I'll talk about him, as he is the antithesis to Borealis. Among the first humans to re-emerge into Gaia, Hazel was the most devoted to the Greater Wills throughout his life and once thanked them for saving him, his sister, and his uncle from the horrid carnage. No matter the horrible things that occurred within Hazel's life, whether it be the death of most of his family, the destruction of his world, the marring of his flesh, and the curse of immortality he bears, he still believed the Greater Wills to be benevolent beings in which he instilled all his faith. That was until he was chosen by them. Due to the death of the universe, the greater will of death had grown so intensely powerful that the other greater wills felt threatened by its power and decided to banish it. Through their combined efforts, they chose their most devoted follower, Hazel, to become the humanoid vessel in which the greater will of death would be contained. Splitting open Hazel's head, death was sealed inside of him, at which point the man was locked away beneath the plane of existence, in a prison from which no escape could be found, save for through the eight keys of the greater wills hid away expertly. Hazel could do nothing but sit in this prison and question why. Why was he chosen as their vessel? Why was he being ripped away from his life and his family? Why was he being punished for his devotion? Why was he chosen to hold death within him, never to leave this prison and simply rot away for eternity, thanks to the destruction of the universe that the greater wills could have stopped? These questions churned in Hazel's head, before he eventually reached his conclusion. The greater wills were fallible, narcissistic beings that care for nothing but themselves. It was then that Hazel devoted himself to their eventual destruction, and began slowly conjuring a plan to eventually escape and destroy this universe and the greater wills that governed it once and for all. Alongside Hazel, there's another godbound who wishes to bring about an end to everything. One who would see the world devolve into pure chaos and madness. This godbound is the last royal from the Winter Court, Bandersnatch. One of the sons of the Winter Queen, Bandersnatch was a winter elf who was deeply curious about the world around him. Training the arcane from a young age and traveling the world to study its ancient ruins and strange creatures that lie within. This curiosity would lead to Bandersnatch eventually delving into the chasms of the earth and discovering the Underfall for himself. Becoming entranced by its mystery and yearning to learn more about it, resulting in him setting up a small lab just outside a large drop into the Underfall within the mountains that he would occasionally visit. However, the comfort of the royal family had come to know would crumble beneath them, as their home was raided by angry revolutionaries who sought to oust the family from power after the queen's failure to address the disgusting wealth gap between the nobles and the working class people, as well as their poor treatment by the guards of the city at the queen's demand. This would result in the entire family being murdered, and the queen being beheaded all save for two, Gwendolyn, the queen's moon elf child for whom she held no love, and thus betrayed her, and Bandersnatch, who managed to barely escape his captors and run into the frozen tundra with a search party hot on his trail. He would eventually return to his lab, desperately trying to think of a solution that would keep him from the same fate as his family, when the Underfall whispered to him. It drew him into its embrace, calling him into the pit and eventually resulting in Bandersnatch throwing himself into the Underfall itself before coming to the realization of what he'd done and screaming for help far too late. He plummeted until the pinprick of light from the outside world was no more, and endless darkness was all that encompassed him. He fell for eternity, his despair and helplessness eating away at his brain as his world became nothing but plummeting darkness. That was until it wasn't. After so long, Bandersnatch no longer felt as though he were falling, but floating. Unsure if this was due to his own brain finally snapping or a true feeling of peace finally washing over him. In this state of Zen, a voice whispered to him, the first voice he'd heard in what felt like an eternity. Hey, you, you come, come here. here. It snickered, with Bandersnatch floating in that direction in an attempt to find its source. Over here, silly, come over here. He'd hear, attempting to float towards the source of the voice, but to no avail, before finally protesting that he couldn't see this being. Then light your eyes on fire. Then you'll be able to see. The voice spoke, 
with Bandersnatch immediately following the voice's instruction and witnessing a horror beyond his comprehension. Some say he saw the jabbering Ma, Kafka, while others speculate that he may have seen the greater will of madness itself. Regardless, Bandersnatch would come to awaken in a forest of black wood and gray soil, where he would build a new, twisted mockery of the High Court of Winter, crowning himself as the King of the Underfall and bringing into existence a cacophony of twisted creatures, such as the Jabberwocks who wander many of the ruins that Bandersnatch was once so enticed by, or the Gibbering Mouthers, said to be pieces of the Jabbering Maw itself that wander the most horrific recesses of Gaia, while other legends say that they are what happens to those who succumb to the curse of mind blight. And you know, there are so many more Godbound I can talk about, like the Nameless King, Godbound of Trickery, the Flame of War, Malachi, who's the Godbound of, y you know, war, <laughs> and Quaint, the ancient supercomputer who'd come to be known as the Godbound of Knowledge, and many, many more. Uh, but since I bothered to draw him for this video, I think I'll tell you about Alant the Golden, uh, Godbound of Sunlight and Heroism as our last Godbound. An honor tiefling, Alant was born from his parents forming a vow to follow and serve the previous godbound of heroism and give him their child, so long as he continued to protect them and give them a prosperous life under his light. This resulted in Alant being a tiefling born with an opaline unicorn horn and golden locks. Alant was taken from his family as per the deal and raised within the church as the former godbound's prodigy, but something was amiss and his shadow could sense it. The former Godbound of Sunlight, I'm just realizing as I'm recording this that I never gave a name to this motherfucker. Upon creating the city of sunlight, Nar Alma, just outside the Sun and Bloom capital, had grown arrogant. He allowed the praises of his followers to go to his head and inflated his ego to the point where he no longer cared for heroism, but instead simply wished to spread his will over others in the name of honor. Thus did the last unicorn, his shadow, begin training Alant in secret teaching the boy the true meaning of heroism and honor, as the Godbound's own teachings had grown tainted. It wasn't long before the former Godbound would notice his subterfuge, and would lock Alant away within the dungeon in his grand chapel, as he prepared for war against the capital of Sonnenblum, Glamorhall, as he believed as the god of sunlight, it was his god-given right to rule over the land of summer. This would lead to the last unicorn betraying him, breaking Lant free of his shackles and assisting him in the fight against the Godbound, at which point his powers were lost and granted to Alant as he was fully recognized as the new Godbound of Heroism and Sunlight. Alant spared the Godbound's life, exiling him from Nar Alma as a means to reflect upon what he'd done, and perhaps one day he would be permitted back into the city. Despite this being against the last unicorn's better judgment, it was ultimately accepted as it was a sign that Alant truly had a heart of gold, thus dubbing him Alant the Golden. However, come the discovery of this attempted coup within Nar Alma's walls, Zinder and Zandro, the twin rulers of the High Court of Summer, sent over their own envoy to join Nar Alma as a sign of good faith, quote unquote, acting as an ambassador and additional advisor to Alant with their true intent being to relay any and all info on Alant's movements to the crowned royalty, and deal with the godbound should they get out of hand yet again. And with that, you know what? Let me tell you about shadows real quick. Let me tell you what a shadow is, just real quick. When the gods of the previous universe perished, they were not completely lost, and instead were remembered and assimilated into the greater wills of their respected domains. From there, once the Greater Wills began creating the Godbound, the Godbound were gifted a shadow in the form of a weakened, slightly altered version of the previous god of their domain, hence Alant's shadow being the last unicorn, the former god of heroism, who earned this title in its attempt to save as many people as it could before the calamity that was the fracture, even though its own death would be assured as a result. Every Godbound has its own shadow, such as Alant and the last unicorn, Bandersnatch and the Jabbering Maw, the Nameless King and the Grinning Cat, Neo Mechanist and the Clockworker, and many, many more that I could go into in a separate video if that interests you all. I just have so much lore that I want to share with everybody. <laughs> and I just keep writing too. I, I really like this format of video. It It's a really fun way of uh, getting to share just the world building that I've been doing. Uh, and I appreciate you guys for watching it.
But that being said, this ends another brief glimpse into the lore of the Godbound in my world. Like I said, I have many more Godbound and I'm constantly making more, so if you want a part two where I talk about more of the Godbound, let me know in the comments. Or if you want to hear about any other aspects of the world, uh, there are plenty to go into. I have so many, I like I said in the previous video, I've rewritten all the lore of the uh, the races, the regular D&D &D races in the world. Uh, I've written about the societies. There are a number of threats to the world that I've written about. There are eight planes of existence that are like completely new and rewritten there are magic items there are I, there's the magic system itself which is based around promises and starlight which i briefly mentioned there's there's so much of this world that i want to like just talk about and i just adore uh so let me know in the comments uh if any of those interest you uh what do you want to hear most and i'll i'll pick one or whichever one you all say you want the most uh but yeah, any and all support is appreciated. Don't forget to like and hit that fucking bell and fucking subscribe and, you know, all the bullshit. <laughs> uh, but that said, thanks y'all for watching the video. I super appreciate it. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Have a great day.